All right, I guess we're already recording. Okay, welcome along to episode seven of Lifting in Life. As you can see, uh, my old mate Josh is away, but we have a very special guest today, Mr. Tim Fox. I'll uh, hand it over to you, Tim, if you could just uh, do a brief intro on all the plates that you spin in your life and just a little snippet into what your day-to-day -day looks like. Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone, I'm Tim. Um, so basically, I own own a gym or a couple of gyms now, um, as well as a couple of other businesses, including a, uh, a electrical firm. Um, and on top of that, obviously, into into bodybuilding. Um, so at an amateur level at the moment, um, hopefully uh, going to make that into a pro level at some point in my in my career. And yeah, that's uh, basically me. So my day to day would look um, at the moment just out of prep. So it'd be getting up, uh, doing some faster cardio uh, before starting my day, um, which generally is electrical based throughout sort of nine to nine till four, I suppose you'd say. And then uh, generally have a couple of clients in the evening before before I train myself. Nice. And you've also got like a little sprinkling of motorsport in there too, as you can see in the background of your little setup there. Yeah. Yeah. So my my base uh, was motorsport. So from 10, I um, started go-karting um, before moving into cars at about 15 and racing at a national level for seven or eight years. Um, so that that's actually why I started training at the gym originally. And then... Uh, basically wanted to to push myself so i got got to my early 20s and i'd been racing nationally quite a bit um but those that are into motorsport know that generally by your early 20s you uh if you're not overseas racing um at a semi-pro level or on that career path uh it's basically you, you're not going to make it as a pro so we um re-evaluated i suppose is what you'd say and uh yeah, tra tra uh, changed trajectory a little bit. So went from racing cars, um, took a step back out of that. Still did the odd, odd racing here and there, and um, started focusing more towards towards the bodybuilding side, just simply because I enjoyed training. Um, yeah, that's actually a perfect segue into the first question I wanted to ask: is what was the the catalyst to you starting in the gym? How old were you? What was going on at the time? And what what made you think? about starting in the gym obviously you touched on it there but if you could just dive into it a little bit more i'd be keen to hear that yeah so i mean there were other factors as well um motorsport was probably one of the main ones so i wanted to get more fit um for my motorsport per for motorsport purposes um i know for those that aren't too familiar with motorsport may have just seen some cars sort of racing but it's actually a lot more more physical and mentally draining than what um what people give it credit for and uh, especially I was doing um, a bit of a mixture at the time. So I was doing um, what we called tier one. So I was racing in production racing series back then as 16, um, which was quite, quite demanding. But then also I transitioned to endurance racing, um, which obviously is physically demanding in a different way because you're in the car for such a long period of time and the, the heat and um, fatigue set in. And then it, it's, it's more of a mental game. You start to lose. You just start to mentally get fatigued like if you're in the car for an hour, hour and a half driving flat out obviously you're going to get fatigued so the gym came in handy there um so a lot of that was more sort of um hip style training i suppose and, and a lot of cardio um and then yeah like uh obviously at the time i was still at high school and i was really really small so i always wanted to put on some size so back then i would have been about 63 kilos um Damn. roughly then about, about yeah, 12 30 kgs ago then yeah yeah about 30 <laughs> kilos ago yeah good for racing uh yeah. but not so good for rugby which i was also playing at the time um so yeah so i wanted to to go to the gym pack on some some lean muscle um and generally get more fit for racing and when you first started out who was kind of giving you the guidance how did you come up with the idea of if i go to the gym it's going to positively benefit my racing and then you know what were the next steps from there to actually crafting and implementing your plan at the time uh at that time it was very much a uh a self-taught uh kind of process mm -hmm. and yeah like this is sort of advice that i tell clients now is um especially those like in the teenage years is 
I wish I had had a, a trainer um, or that sort of, uh, you know, available to me. Um, neither of my parents are big into, into the gym or anything like that. So I didn't really have much there in terms of what I should be doing, should be doing. Um, at the time, it was quite funny, actually, when I first wanted to get into the gym, I remember uh, my mum was against it because she thought that I was too young. And so I had to... How old were you? Like 17, 18? <laughs> no, yeah, I was slightly younger. I would have been, I think I was 16. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. I, I think I started sort of thinking about it at 15 and then, and yeah, like, you know, year 10, fourth form. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until I was 16 that, that she seriously considered it. And then we met with um, my PE teacher at the time to get his thoughts on it and <laughs> explain so, the science <laughs> explain yeah, that um, i'm not gonna get shorter or stop growing from lifting yep, a couple that's of um that's <laughs> yeah. the classic isn't it it's not gonna yeah. stunt my growth yeah i mean i'm only like a little over five nine so <laughs> oh, who well, knows? maybe, maybe it's a little bit um but yeah once well, she was satisfied that it wasn't gonna do that mm -hmm. um yeah then i was allowed to allowed to go to the gym um yeah and then it was very much self-taught. I mean, I did read a lot of uh, material, mm -hmm. um, primarily around racing and like what race, how racing drivers trained, um, and so I implemented that. But then also, obviously, did the classic bro split, I suppose you call it, where it was yeah. just like go and train some, train some random muscles and because when, um, when I when I started at the gym and I was like thirteen or fourteen, so it would have been about the exact same time as you starting the gym because I think you're a couple years older. I can't remember. Was YouTube even a thing then with like people know, giving out fitness advice? Not hugely. I, I not. feel like it wasn't. It took like a couple of years. Like until yeah. like, you know, the fitness influencing learning on social media actually became a thing. I feel like it was mostly word of mouth or you read something or you see some article or. Absolutely. I'm trying to hmm. think. I think, um, I mean, that would have been 2010 maybe yeah around 2009 um mm -hmm. yeah 2009 i was definitely in the gym in 2010 yeah um yeah i suppose pre pre youtube like uh tutorials i suppose you'd, yeah you'd call it um so yeah it was very much yeah like i i, I read um uh, material about what racing drivers did and then in terms of uh the muscle side it was very much just people that were at the gym just like older yeah. older people like talking to them um seeing what they thought sort of bouncing ideas off of off of them and um obviously there was uh so i went to hut high and there was at that time i was training at jenkins which is um not too far away so there's quite a few students that also went there so obviously talking to each other and bouncing ideas off and obviously a few people had like older brothers and that kind of thing that that knew yeah. so much word of doing. mouth and conversation a lot of word of mouth I, yeah. yeah yeah um yeah and when you implemented the new training did you um notice or measure much of a performance difference in your driving uh not in terms of how i would now uh, i mean like i didn't go down and write down exactly how i was feeling like after each race um i, I did notice how much less fatigued i was getting but it wasn't it wasn't measured as such like it, it wasn't a you know I, I didn't have a diary that i wrote down how i felt after each race and like to see how that changed also didn't knew nothing about nutrition so yeah like nutrition obviously later on in my um sort of bodybuilding life i suppose became such a big factor whereas back then like if i knew what now what i knew then i would have been able to get even more out of that definitely yeah, you get um, off to a way nutrition. better start it's That's so right. easy to look back on that and you start off just kind of doing whatever's in front of you and like just kind of winging it and not really thinking about what you're eating at all and it, you often kind of it's easy to look back and think damn like if i could implement what i know now then like what i could have become potentially you know or where where that Absolutely. could have fast tracked my progress like if i'd known back then that hot chips and pies didn't help you with your <laughs> racing then you know who knows what could happen um, i mean it seems like they would right <laughs> yeah I mean, high energy right? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> got your potato in there got a carb sauce yeah. got some meat. Yeah. um yeah but very much like obviously hindsight's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. so getting sort of further down the track you're still doing your racing when was it that you started to um adapt your training and start to think about more of a bodybuilding putting on size not just training for you know racing performance 
my early 20s i'd say so thinking back i think i did my first ever show when i was about 21 i would have been um i was still racing at that time uh but it didn't coincide with the racing season so it was all right like that uh the i think i just did wellington back then which would have been september so the racing national season started in october so that winter i sort of trained um for the comp for the comp and then moved to that um and the reason for that was simply i'd noticed quite a bit of progress in myself and i was just interested to to try and compete basically to to see how far i could push that yeah um, like you already saw your your body sort of responding well to the training and the stimulus that you kind of got you thinking about how far you can push it absolutely um competing back then to me competing now looked very very different obviously yeah. and i was in a different category <laughs> i did physique um, yeah. which now I do classic um but yeah like it was basically more of a, a me thing like i just i was feeling good like feeling myself basically 21 like mm -hmm. put on a bit of muscle um and, and kind of wanted to get out there and put it against other people that um yeah. that were into the same sort of thing and at that time I already knew that racing was only going to be a serious hobby for me. So oh, yeah. I wasn't too concerned with um, necessarily staying as fit for racing. So, yeah, that's kind of how that transition started. Um, it's, it's probably quite a positive thing that you recognize that early and then you're able to commit more seriously to competing instead of still trying to half ass both of them in a way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that show I did. Um, it, but it wasn't you know i did that show and then that was it for three years i believe mm -hmm. um but yeah absolutely like i mean i knew that yeah racing was just going to be a hobby and i wasn't going to try try chase it like professionally like I, after that i still i did get a free drive after that and um a national series so i was quite lucky there um but i was still quite fit obviously like i i wasn't you know i was still only like maybe 75 kilos ish um maybe even slightly lighter than that on stage but yeah sitting around 75 so i still wasn't by any means big like yeah. i didn't have huge muscle mass to the point where it made it difficult to fit in the car or mm -hmm. um or race or anything like that so so yeah but absolutely like i didn't want to half us half us either thing i don't like mm. half assing anything so yeah yeah that's quite evident <laughs> so if if there's someone else out there who is in a similar kind of position in terms of um not knowing what to commit to or contemplating whether to commit to two things what would you say would, would be a good way of of deciding whether to commit to both or go deep into one or you know how did you make that decision it's uh it's quite a few parts to that i think it's also very specific to the individual and, and like their position mm -hmm. uh, i mean both motorsport and bodybuilding are relatively expensive yep. um motorsport is next level expensive <laughs> and that kind of made the decision for us in a way mm -hmm. um so by then yeah like i said i was starting to get a little bit older like i mean the guys there were some people my age that I was racing against but a lot of the guys were sort of in their in their mid-teens mm -hmm. and i was and they were going on obviously moving on to the next category and then going up but the next category you know was say formula ford and that's about hundred thousand a season to race Fire and up, i was like thinking like we almost did it I we did and I sort of sat down because I had sponsors back then and we discussed it but we also you know we're very realistic with it so I said you know we could do it and we could we'd have enough to maybe do sort of one season um competitively but where's that really going to end end up so mm -hmm. that's the kind of tough conversations that you have to have and mm yeah i mean i suppose if you're doing sports say such as like basketball or rugby or that kind of thing it is possible to do to do multiple um yeah. from a financial point of view that's sure. i suppose that that decision would come down more to like where does your actual passion lie mm. you know like, yeah, like are you passionate to the point of wanting to turn pro and say basketball are you yeah. passionate of wanting to turn uh, to the point of wanting to turn pro and bodybuilding yeah because you're not going to turn pro in both of them right if if you're really that serious about it I mean it's going to come a time where you probably have to commit to the one that's right i mean was it phil heath yeah. that um was yeah, really into basketball. basketball yeah so i mean there's always those sort of decisions in life mm. um i do believe that and yeah i suppose it, it comes down to sort of the individual and and you do have to sit down and seriously ask yourself those questions like yeah 
am I good enough to to take this this far to the point of where I want to get to? Mm. Do I want to take that that far to the point of where I want to get to? Do that I just want both like as a, a hobby? Yeah, it sounds like an element of self awareness is kind of what you're getting at there, right? You yeah. you quickly recognize that. I guess that 100k on the line is also a good motivator as well but <laughs> you know what's a more viable path yeah. for you and that's right the yeah. self-awareness element in there um was obviously a big driving factor i reckon yeah but obviously also enjoyment i yeah. mean like if you're if you're really enjoying the sport that you're doing um and then yeah like there's quite a few factors that come into it i suppose um and, and everybody is different like you know some people are more than happy to to keep both as hobbies and just yeah. like they, if they say they're feeling themselves they'll do a bodybuilding show and they're happy to keep it at the amateur level and, mm. and it, as a hobby that they can do um they do in, in their spare time i suppose and ob obviously you have to commit just to get onto the yeah. stage massively <laughs> yeah, right. massively yeah. i'm yeah. Not, not saying that it's not easy but no. I, I am saying that it, it is possible to do that mm. but i think it's when you want to take that next step and yeah, it's like and, what's the desired outcome from absolutely. doing this thing yeah 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 mm. that's that's the one nice all right looping back all the way to your first show in physique can you tell me um more detail how that went you know how did you prep for the show <laughs> what do you reckon you look like what was it like stepping on stage in your bodies for the first time you know uh terrifying yep <laughs> <laughs> very <Simply>. much terrifying <laughs> yeah. um yeah i yeah didn't really have much of a clue as to what was going on i hadn't even watched a bodybuilding show at that point which is a big mistake i tell everybody now that's into yeah. it like go and at least watch one show at the so very least one was show. it just like you saw you know the olympias or something like what what want yeah what made you want to do a show honestly it was just because i was feeling good like that yeah. that was it for me like if, i know yeah. yeah people were they were all different mm, in that way um i didn't follow bodybuilding um back then really um i was training at les mills i knew uh i, I did have a pt and he had competed and so mm. i sort of had a chat to him and i was like what do you think and he's like yeah go for it like give it a go and so yeah that's kind of how it all started had no idea what i was doing like meal prep wise he yeah. gave me some like nutrition guidance that kind of thing yeah. had no idea what carving up was anything yeah. like that so so were you I mean, smashing my cardio, heaps of cardio or anything through your prep? Like how long was, I was it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I remember, I mean, we're going back what, <laughs> a wee while now, seven years, well, yes, um, yeah. seven, eight years. I remember towards the end, I think I was doing about an hour and 20 minutes of cardio Sheesh. a day. And I was yeah. a real, yeah, a classic, classic mistake. I, yeah. Because I, I was an apprentice back then. I was an apprentice electrician. So oh, man, your output it, would have been so high already. It was it was terrible because I was on fifteen hundred yeah. cal ish as well. Um, yeah. We we had me on, and so I'd go do a full day full day of work, and I would fit my cardio after my weights. So like oh, I'd man. get to the gym at like six thirty because I'd have dinner <laughs> first. Yeah, go train weights and then be like okay sweet yeah hour twenty of cardio. This is gonna be oh, fun. So it wasn't even split. You weren't doing like no. morning evening no damn bro that's what i do now yeah. and yeah it looks very very different now um, yeah yeah <laughs> i just remember having to try and get as lean as possible and i was yeah. not pleasant to be around at that no. time <laughs> especially man with that like the the electrician stuff as well because you'd be walking around doing so many steps as well you'd be on your feet all day and yeah. then go hit weights and then do cardio bro you'd have no energy at all <laughs> yeah yeah, it was pretty shocking looking back at it to be honest mm -hmm. um there were quite a few cheat meals involved but yeah yeah i mean it's my first show i, d I definitely could have looked better obviously mm -hmm. um at the show but i went and did it and yeah. you know there was it was quite a big class i think there was 14 of us just in my class oh wow that's yeah, it was like 140 odd competitors in total oh, for the damn. for the whole event yeah. so it was it was a big big show yeah. um and you were about to delve into your carving up and your, your peak week there yeah how did that look uh we did water deplete so mm -hmm. i remember doing that and um i sort of just got talked through it by by my my pt at the time yeah and so yeah so i mean i did the classic like actually that was the biggest water deplete I'd, i've ever done was that oh, show. Wow. <laughs> and it was like because he said you know take 13 liters i think that was on the Whoa. It would have been this Sunday, then 10 on the Monday. What, 13 litres yeah. in a day? <laughs> Bro, how, crazy. how did you even do that? Uh, it was, yeah, I was Whoa. taking a piss a lot. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah so like it was like something like that i think i did 13 10 7 5 and then uh oh no so 7 3 and then 750 mil 750 mil and 500 mils on show day that's hectic and And what did your food look like yeah uh we just depleted right through till the friday night and then had pizza I don't know. You depleted that harder than just had some pizza. Yeah, yeah. So oh, it did wow. not carve up enough either. Yeah, no way. Oh man, so, it sounds like a very interesting experience for you. It was. Yeah. <laughs> it was interesting. I mean, yeah. Like, I mean, I got up on stage, did my thing. I definitely did not come last. Um, yeah. So, so with that, I was kind of happy. Obviously, hadn't really practiced posing anywhere near mm. enough. And it yeah. was after that show that I said to myself, "If I do this again, I need to." do it properly like like pose a lot more often just to to have a better idea for when when you're on stage because as soon as you're on stage obviously adrenaline yeah. kicks in and everything like that so unless you're well practiced yeah you do not have control of your movements eh? <laughs> no, no um yeah yeah so that was my experience for my first show yeah uh i definitely like if i'm taking someone to their first show and, or anything like that now mm. i try and um learn from what i did wrong yeah. and give them um quite a quite a lot of advice around, around that yeah and generally i haven't had anyone yet that hasn't watched a bodybuilding show or follows bodybuilding a little bit at least yeah so so that's yeah that's that, that's probably actually a, a good question for you if if someone obviously never competed before i suppose goes to the gym but wants to compete what would be a few pieces of advice that that you would give to them obviously one which you've already mentioned is go watch a show before you do a show I think watching the show is <laughs> probably the big thing because I think yeah. if I'd watched the show, I would have known a lot more as to what, what obviously what to expect on the day. Um, yeah, because there is all that behind the scenes stuff. But uh, yeah, um, watch the show. Invest in a very in a good coach. Invest in someone yeah. that you can trust to mm-hmm. to take you to the show. That's um, that's probably first and foremost. That's probably more important than than the actual show day. Absolutely. Um, and be realistic with expectations, like. You see, I don't know. I, I hear about a lot of people, you know, wanting to to place, you know, on their first event or or yeah. get a certain position on their first event, something like that. And to be honest, um, bodybuilding can be a tough sport, uh, like ego wise and like self esteem wise. Yeah. So you need to be realistic with yourself. Like, you know, it's, if it's your first show, it's your first show. It's it's a feat just getting to the stage um, purely because of how tough it is on on yourself mentally and physically. Absolutely. So. Yeah, be realistic with expectations. And I think that comes potentially with going and watching a show. Because after you've seen a show, you've seen what people look like, you've seen how they present themselves. Um, mm. And also a good coach keeps you in check too. Like someone like Philly, oh, usually. he's yeah. like, to get a compliment out of him, you know, he's, <laughs> he's not he's not going to give you a big ego. He's no. always keeping you in check, which is a very good, very measured approach because you I, stay much more humble. I think so. I think you need to be humble going into a show because I think if, as soon as you become, as soon as you're not humble and you go to mm. a show and you don't get the result that you want, it'll it'll mm. break you. Like you know, it will break you. I feel like people who don't compete and don't know bodybuilding would find that such a like a contradiction. You have to be a humble person who wants to look as best as they possibly can. <laughs> you know, humility and bodybuilding just don't seem to match. But it's very true because you're so fragile, man. Like if you if you don't have you know an element of humility there and you go there and you do get shit on by everyone mm. and you're not going to feel good afterwards that's no. why like I, I like how you touched on the process and enjoying that and then being realistic with yourself right absolutely yeah i mean you're you're going against yourself i think mm-hmm. is probably the best way that i could describe bodybuilding or at mm. least my experience with it is like Yes, you obviously want to place as 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 well as you can against other people, but first and foremost, you're there to prove to yourself that you can do it, yeah. not to anyone else. Yeah, you know, like, and that's the same. I mean, I've done a few shows now, and uh, you, so far, I've approached every every show the same. Sure, yeah, yeah I, I have my sort of goals as to, you know, uh, maybe coming in like the top three in the class, but definitely mm-hmm. not on my first few shows. It's mm-hmm. And it's more of a case of even if I don't place in the top top say three or whatever, um, did I look better than last time? Yeah, it's you yes, against I you, do. right? Yeah, that's yeah. it. You're all, it's, you're always against yourself, mm. and you're the benchmark. Like, yeah, you, you don't, your body doesn't change. It's not like you can go to your first show, 
and be like, okay, sweet, I got this for my next show. I'm gonna, you know, look like Nick Walker. Yeah, like, gonna, it doesn't it doesn't happen like I'm that. I'm putting yeah. on 40 kgs of lean body <laughs> yeah. weight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. On that basis, to put a perspective, yeah. I've been I've gained like roughly two and a half kilos in the last 12 yeah. months of yeah. muscle, <laughs> which so, is a lot still, but that's still a lot. But it's yeah, not it's 40 about, kilos. And it's not it's a yeah. pro, <laughs> pro bodybuilder level. But I mean, even yeah. them, you know, by the time they they've built most of their their physique, they are only mm. putting on a kilo here and there like of muscle yeah. each year. It's more yeah. about that shaping, right? But yeah, yeah. very much you against you. I think yeah. humility is important mm -hmm. to, to a degree. Obviously, yeah. you have confidence as well. But <laughs> yeah, but yeah it, it's a it's a fine line, and yeah. it is tough mentally, and it affects people very differently. Is something that I've noticed as well um, yeah. with with the mental side of it. Mm. Like yeah, it, it is. It can be very tough. Yeah, I think um, a really cool part of doing a prep for a bodybuilding show that bridges over to your life, or at least what I contemplated when I was prepping for my shows, it really got me thinking like, damn, if I can commit myself this hard to something for 15 weeks, how can I apply that same commitment to something else? Like what might be starting a business or, you know, your job, something. How, what can I do in my, you know, other plates that I spin? that you know what could i achieve from adding that commitment to those plates that i spin too is that Absolutely. something that you think about or apply to you know other plates that you spin yes um i mean those that know me and know the various plates that i spin yeah know, know sort of how dedicated i am to to business as well um but that's just what i'm passionate about like most of my businesses uh, are my passion maybe Bar the electrical um in terms of straight passion uh that that's very much a, a business yeah but obviously my gyms like that's that's my passion project so mm. yeah how i apply myself and like my mental um sort of capacity to those yeah sure it come, comes down I, I suppose to a similar way of thinking um i'm more or less like quite a logical thinker um, yep. i suppose and i like to have a plan like mm -hmm. i everything is <laughs> planned structure. for me yeah. yeah i need i need structure and that for me works that yeah. doesn't work for everybody like some people I, are good great without structure but i feel like that's a classic bodybuilders thing with your diet pretty much everything is weighed out i like knowing what my training plan is it's all measured and calculated but what i find is that if you add that structure to your life it actually gives you more freedom because there's so many elements you just no longer have to think about you're not thinking every single day mm, what should i have for dinner tonight or <laughs> mm, what should i have for lunch yeah like, it takes right. away that mental i mean imagine trying to fit six load. meals and having to contemplate each meal <laughs> <laughs> or make some <laughs> restaurant quality eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah bodybuilding meals and not generally restaurant quality that's no. for sure Couple try of, to make them taste spices. as good as possible yeah. and then that's, that's pretty much <laughs> yeah. it um but yeah yeah mm -hmm. definitely definitely like the mental side aspects mm -hmm. yeah you would apply it to, to other other parts of your life mm -hmm. um yeah unless you're unless you're a full-time bodybuilder yes yeah. it is your life probably, that is your life so <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right going all the way back to that first show you mentioned how um at the time you're doing your apprenticeship but then after that first show you took a three-year gap what mm -hmm. did that three-year gap look like I was still, I did a little bit more motorsport. So I competed when I was about 21. Uh, then I raced that full season, that off season, and then another full season. And then it was after that, that, that we gave it up. So that would have seen me through to when I was about 22, 23. Mm -hmm. um, to be fair, uh, well, to be honest, after the first show, I probably wasn't in the best like mental state in terms of like wanting to compete again. Like it yeah. kind of, you know, while, whilst I knew that I'd like achieve something quite quite great I knew that I wasn't like anywhere near sort of the the top end and yeah. in motorsport at the time I kind of was yeah. so to me I was like I'm gonna do racing because yeah you know I, I have the chance to win um so well that's interesting so at that point although you decided to compete you still hadn't fully decided to commit to the competing you actually yeah. almost like not necessarily went back on yourself but decided uh, actually I think the racing is more where you know I, I'm, my talents lie yeah but my training was more bodybuilder train build a bodybuilding style training oh, yeah. so yeah. i realized then and there that i need to push a lot harder in the gym so i had started pushing a lot harder in the gym i started um 
I'd, I'd like met new people obviously at the show so i started talking to them about like how how they do things and mm -hmm. and sort of what i could be doing better and that that for me to be fair that that's probably something that i do apply to absolutely every aspect of my life is yeah can i do this better mm. or can i do this more efficiently or in a manner that's going to benefit me better than how i am currently doing it and it sounds um, like you employ um your networking skills quite well in that <laughs> yeah i'll try to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I mean, obviously, networking is very important in, in mm -hmm. any sort of walk of life nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, especially with with Jim and that sort of thing. Like, mm -hmm. the more people that you can you can get in to to say post on socials yeah. about the space that you've got, or like, depending on what demographic you want to hit, you know, mm -hmm. getting those sort of relevant people or influencers in, into your space to, mm -hmm. and promoting how you want it promoted. Obviously, that's that's going to get more people, more like minded people in. Yep. So, so yeah, so net networking is very very important mm -hmm. so you go back to the the racing so you decided right. to commit back to the racing yeah so i was training my training didn't reflect my racing so i was, mm -hmm. I was still i was training as a as a bodybuilder i suppose is what you'd say you know um sort of my splits uh were, were more consistent with bodybuilding training um i wasn't too worried about how fit i was for racing at that time i was just kind of doing it and doing it to the best of my ability um yeah, and I kept racing, had the three years off. And I mean, in that time, I must have got qualified. I must have just been qualified for my next show. And obviously, I was focusing on my apprenticeship, um, other things in my life, you know, like just various other things, obviously, apprenticeships mm -hmm. um, and like friends and being social and, and a different time in my life. And yep. yeah, early 20s, you know, yep. I wanted to go out and, and enjoy them as much as possible which is and, an important thing too there's that i don't know if this is going off on too much of a tangent but there's that whole you know hustle culture don't go out of the weekends like grind all the time but i think especially man in your early 20s like that's such a fundamental social networking um part of your life that that is such an important thing to do in my opinion i think so too for most people i'd yeah. say for most people yeah like obviously you've always got um the extremes out mm. there like the extreme people that that don't that can hustle all the yeah. time and it works for them and, yeah. and they do make it work but you're probably talking about one percent of the yeah. population that can do that and i think you need to enjoy yourself at some point in your life mm -hmm. otherwise you're gonna get to like your 30s and look back yeah. and be like what did i actually do <laughs> like did i yeah. actually do what i wanted to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and honestly sometimes things can get put in perspective as well when you take that time like yeah. if you're spending time with friends that kind of thing for say a year obviously 21st season is a big thing mm -hmm. uh in new zealand so you know spending time with all your friends over the 21st season you get to the end of like your friend group's 21st season you're like that was fun mm. but i think you know i want to try say yeah. bodybuilding again and it's like yeah. okay cool so now i can commit to that yeah. i've done all the partying i've got that mm -hmm. sort of out my system mm -hmm. let's move on let's let's try this next next thing yeah. So, so what did the next sort of stab at it look like? How did it um, come to fruition again? You know, what were your thought processes around it? What made you want to get into it again? How did you know it was the right time for you to give it another crack? So by then I had, where was I? So I would have been about 24, I'd freshly qualified. So I didn't have the stress of the apprenticeship over me. That was a big thing. Cause obviously when you're an apprentice doing a lot of hours, I mean, I was doing mm -hmm six days a week back then right, right. um for the you know in my apprenticeship working i mean our standard week was 44 and then we're doing a lot of overtime so i was doing at least 50 to 55 hour weeks at a minimum oh wow like usually more around 60 plus the training plus the night classes and the study i was about um, to say imagine adding in your bodybuilding and yeah well, it's well, just not really feasible right yeah it was i mean my first show was for my very like when i was with my very first company and the, the hours were a bit but smaller there so mm -hmm. so that worked but yeah i definitely i knew like um for those next couple of years that that was not going to happen because obviously yeah. tech gets out harder as well like it, yeah. you know you're you're doing more advanced levels of learning therefore you need to apply yourself more to that and um so there was that factor as well and so i, I sort of knew that if i did compete during those next few years i was never going to be able to put myself all into it so yeah, I took, took those few few years off. And to be fair, like my training had improved. I was putting on size easier, like 
you know, I was getting older. Like I noticed that muscle was actually starting to come on a bit easier because yeah. I really struggled with that for a long time. Like I used to be able to eat as much, you know, anything, and I would just never put on size uh, or mm -hmm. weight. Whereas now it was starting to slow down. I think I was up to sort of mid eighties at the time. Like yeah, carrying quite a bit of fat, but I put on some size, which for me was just a, a feed in itself. Yeah. And so I got to that stage. Um, it was actually Devin that was my PT at the time of my second show. Cool. Who's the uh, co-owner of the gym? Yeah, so yep. my business partner, co-owner of Fitness Portal, um, Devin. So I started just PTing with him. He had no idea about bodybuilding, had never done anything, but I was a bit foolish, but thought that I knew enough about, because by then I was following bodybuilding quite quite a bit more, like I, I you know, seen some shows, you know, yeah. was, was into it. So I thought, you know what, like if he's just training me, I can coach myself. <laughs> and Classic. Uh, <laughs> classic. Yeah. yeah, this is why, this yeah. is why I know you need a good coach. You yeah. need a good coach. Learning from experience. You cannot do it yourself. Um, no, no. But anyway, so yeah, I put on some size, feeling good again. Um, so I thought, you know what, like let's give this a go. And so I talked to Devin about it and he was all for it because he was a fresh PT. So yeah. he's like, yeah, let's, let's, let's smash it. Let's go <laughs> let's for it. it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yeah. Uh, so this training was really good. Um, but my cut was nowhere near long enough. I think my cut was like eight weeks. I was probably still, I was probably, I'm probably leaner now at like 12 weeks out than what I was on stage <laughs> at, at that Damn. show. So yeah. oh, I probably exaggerated a little bit, but yeah. um, more or less. Pretty close and, to it. Yeah. Pretty close to it um did physique again and yeah like the big thing for me i think i think it was a mindset thing so the first show i didn't have a hell of a lot of muscle i uh, didn't have a hell of a lot of size to me so i was like this next show i want more muscle so with that instead of coming in you know conditioned and hard uh i sort of came in soft and so the because full, i full, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and um just simply because I didn't want to be the smallest guy on stage. And that, that was the big mindset for me. It was, I don't want to be looking small on stage instead of, you know, actually looking, looking good. Um, and the ironic thing though, is that if you're leaner, you actually look bigger too. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But that's all I'm learning. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> um, so yeah. So I did Wellington again, yeah. uh, did bodies. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think classic was a class yet still. No, it wouldn't have been because that would have been 2014. Yeah, I feel like Classic didn't come in until maybe it was like 2017 or 2016. Yeah. yeah, it was quite a new class, quite a new yeah. class. Um, so yeah, just a just a physique didn't really have legs back then anyway. So mm -hmm. um, keep them covered up, <laughs> keep them covered up, chuck some bodies on, we're all good. Yeah. Um, yeah, like obviously, it's still a great experience. Like every time I've been on stage, I've, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, so so that's the main thing, you still have to enjoy it at the end of the day. Yeah, and... that just got me thinking for people who don't know anything about bodybuilding <clears throat> when it comes to guys competing in ifbb there's a few classes so you got your physique mm -hmm. which is board shorts so shorts literally down to your knees you got classic which is trunks but it, you got a weight cap for your height and then you got bodybuilding which are the big dudes and the speedos where there's yeah. no weight cap so no, no limits no limits, yeah, no yeah, limits yeah. Exactly. Get, get, get as big as you can and mm -hmm. come in as shredded as you can yeah <laughs> But yeah, actually, that's it's probably good to explain that. <laughs> yeah. I feel like when you know it so well, you don't realize. You yeah, you forget. Like, you just like, like, oh, your physique. People, I was doing physique. <laughs> some like, people have no idea what we're talking about. What the hell about. is physique? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so then, obviously, you did that first. Well, your second, second show, but the yeah. first of the the new the new run, and then well, what, it took another three years. Uh, actually, probably longer off. I oh, think wow. that that was the. That was the last show I did before I started training with Philly. So I think, um, yeah, I, I can't remember. I know my first show with Philly would have been 2020, and I was training with him for a year before that, so 2019. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that sounds about right. So my, actually, sorry, so my first show must have been 2014, second show 2017, yeah. and then I competed in 2020 because I knew that it was like three-year gaps between. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, again, I left that show actually feeling mentally I was in a better state than after mm -hmm. my first show. Um, I was also a bit older. So so sort of knew, I, I knew a bit more about what to expect. So again, yeah. that comes back to, you know, what we're saying about, you, you know, go and watch a show, yeah. sort of know what you're in for. Expectation management. Expectations, yeah. Because that, that, can, that can change things mentally for you big time. Mm -hmm. um, so in that gap between 
was it 2017 and 2020 was that when you open up the first fitness portal gym right. Tony yep. yeah so how, how did that come about so obviously I was into fitness um I, I was freshly qualified uh, electrician I was into fitness I always kind of had uh, a thought in my mind about potentially becoming a personal trainer um and then basically one day just one day randomly Devin who is um I mean he might have been PT me at the time sort of said hey look like lower hut is uh looking uh, has an opening and you know would you like to do it so I uh, had lower, s- lower hut what sorry uh city fitness city oh, yeah, fitness yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Had, had a PT opening and yeah. of course um city fit do their own sort of uh apprenticeship training yeah. training yeah through through them so yeah he came to me said that and so I went away had a big thing by this point I was like I suppose a site foreman is what you'd say like I was running sites for um uh, my old employer uh, in the electrical and obviously doing six days a week still working sort of 50 to 60 hour weeks minimum um so doing a lot of hours earning decent money um you know secure i suppose is what you call it like yeah starting my career in that it could easily continue down that more comfortable path where that's right it, it yeah. seems like it was all kind of lining up for you in terms of comfort security and financial financial security as well that's right, but I like making things hard on myself. So yeah. I had a big. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah. I don't have enough plates spinning at the moment. <laughs> what can I spin? No, I mean, well, back then it was literally just, uh, yeah, it was just site foreman and, and training on the side, and that mm-hmm. was that was more or less it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so so I knew that it wasn't going to be possible for me to stay with uh, with my role, like in my role, and become a PT. So it was going to be a big transition because I knew that I was going to have to go self-employed. So uh, I made that call. I. You know, I thought about it for a month, talked to my employer and said, look, like something's come up. I want a change. I'm going to try personal training. Um, uh, I did say to them that I was also going to start an electrical company mm-hmm. alongside that just to do a couple of days a week to get me by financially. Yeah. So, of course, they're more happy about me going down the PT route than starting <laughs> yeah, a, a Becoming a direct company. competitor. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and then that's kind of how that started. So I left... Uh, my old company I, I got mm-hmm. um I left my employer I by then I'd already sort of set up myself so I set up like you know my business bank accounts the businesses yeah. themselves the names of them mm-hmm. um and uh the study back then for City Fit was just all online so I just had started then they ended up bringing up the timeline so that must have been January must have been January that would have been 2018 January 2018 was when mm-hmm. I left uh mainline electrical started my electrical company and um i think i was meant to start for city fit in like the february or march yeah. but then they ended up turning around and saying oh can you start in january can you make the next intake oh, wow. and i was like should i haven't actually started the, <laughs> the yeah, uh, online learning. and this is going to yeah. sound terrible but i actually did it in about three days oh, and then um <laughs> good to go <laughs> sounds real bad <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah and did that really quickly but then we had like a week block course after that and started personal training and um yeah i mean like i already had clients that are pretty planned again it's mm-hmm. just me like i I'd already sort of started telling people that i'm, I'm personal yeah. training like you know who wants to train with me started to get my sort of um you know ducks in a row in that sense and so by the time that i hit the gym floor and city in the hut i think i had five clients from day dot already mm-hmm. um already signed I, i'd be keen to delve into that a little bit because I know, say, I went from doing my tra- my psychology degree to then being like, nah, stuff this, I'm doing personal training. Then I went back to my degree. But then I personal trained for a few years. COVID hit. I was like, nah, I'm going back into corporate. I'm going <laughs> into corporate. So I know there's the, that transitional phase between, it's, all, it's almost bigger than the jobs. It's like an identity thing. Like at the time, you're the sparky. You're Tim the sparky who lifts weights. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're going through a big change and a big shift and your identity changes into PT. You still got your sparky business as well. But I know that transitional phase is a point of interest for people. How yeah. did you, you know, just flick the switch and make that decision to go from all that comfort and security you chatted about to completely unknown like unknown financial changes, insecurity because of, you know, contracting only your own business? Yeah. It's so hard to know. What was that transitional phase like? I mean, it was over a reasonable period of time because, I mean, I I think I gave my employer over a month's notice. I think I gave him like six weeks notice, which means that I'd already made that decision sort of early December before I'd even talked to them. So 
I think planning was a big thing. Like um, after you, I mean, I'm. I suppose for me, I like to make a decision so then I can work on that decision and mm. then um, go from there. I, I'm. I can be impulsive, but not about this bigger stuff. Um, so basically, it was a case of planning like mm. i was already training with people every now and then like not training them but just training with them and so they ended up becoming clients basically mm. so so i sort of talked i think actually look thinking back like i talked to them before i actually made that decision like oh yeah if i became a pt like you know do you think i'm you'd like to to train with me like that kind mm. of conversation um and that sort of yeah that, that when people started having a positive uh sort of look at that for me that that kind of made that decision like quite quite easy and yes i mean it was it was very much a passion like i was like my, my i mean a bit, bit of background is but my, my, my dad's self-employed and mm-hmm. does he's always done what, what his passion is which is restoring classic cars so i knew i've always known you know, at some point I was going to be self-employed. I didn't know mm. how, why, what, any but of that. It, it's I like having him that. shows shows you that it's possible. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, yeah, I, I want to try to do it even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he's doing good, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and I was like, I, like this opportunity coming out, just it almost seemed like a sign in some ways, I suppose. Mm. It was like, okay, here's my passion now. Like, I'm really into this. I, mm-hmm. I could make it like a career. Um, you know, and I'd always, by then I was al- already thinking like, you know, shit, if I won lotto, I'd, I'd open my own gym, you know, that, that kind of thought. Yeah. Uh, so I knew that it was something that I wanted to do. And I think once you know that something is what you want to do, it's just a case of, okay, how do we make it happen then? How do we, yeah. how do we get to where we want to be? Mm. Um, and so that position becoming available at that point in time, made that decision for me and then talking to those the, the clients and that kind of thing helped with that yeah so what i'm taking from that is that you one first obviously have to come up with the idea but then two you like to put the action plan in place and start the wheels turning prior to actually flipping the switch it's like there's like a bridge Absolutely. or a crossover first you don't just go i want to be a pt and then tomorrow hand in your resignation Absolutely. you put in some groundwork first if it's possible to put that groundwork and put those wheels mm. in motions prior, yeah. that's obviously gonna gonna help you with that transition, right? Like, I mean, I understand that you don't always have that comfort because you don't always have that time to make that decision. Like, I know mm. a lot of PTs that where it was a case of like, oh, I don't know what to do. Like, like mm. they may have left their job, they may have been let go, whatever the situation. It, you know, for them, it may just be, I'm gonna do this because I kind of like fitness and you know it's something to do and yeah. it, i mean those courses through say a city make it very easy for people to just jump in and just do it mm-hmm. um some people can do okay through that method i haven't seen too many do really well out of that method generally the people that do well that i've seen are the pre-planners they're the ones yeah. that like it's an educated decision it's like okay i like this i can make it work this is how i need to make it work this is what I need to do before I say leave my job now to make it work. Yeah, um, yeah I was never going to ever leave my job without having something to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and on the electrical front, I knew that I had you know some friends, some family friends, that kind of thing to just get the ball rolling with that. Mm-hmm. I already had a vehicle at the time, like a, a Ute, yeah. so that just became my work vehicle. Already had my tools. I was already well set up. So that was quite easy. It was just a case of going out, getting jobs here and there. And then that mm-hmm. just sort of grew through word of mouth naturally. What were some of the biggest barriers you faced in that transition? Because it all sounds, you know, happy and lovely. Too easy. And linear, <laughs> yeah. I did it this when I did this. It wasn't too linear. Um, yeah. From a PT perspective, I mean, my PT experience was probably... I want to say better than most people's to, to be completely honest like Especially at that time having some people straight off the bat yeah i was very very that lucky helpful. that yeah. that was that was me being quite lucky to be honest um i had those clients so i think by the end of my first week i had five already signed um consistently plus you know city at That's that time real good. it can take people a month to get yeah. as many people signed I, 
I mean, I had because I knew what days I needed. I wanted to do electrical. What days I wanted to PT. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my goal was something. Oh, I think it was something like fifteen. It was either fifteen hours a week of PT or fifteen clients worth. But I hit that within four weeks. I think. Oh wow. Um, but remember at that time, like City Fitness. I mean, I was at base at City Fit. Like City Fit was growing. I think they had over a hundred members each week. Oh, um, a uh, oh, hundred additional wow. members each week. That's insane. Yeah, and they had. I think I was the sixth PT to come on, and every other PT was already established. Yeah, and so you could call that luck, but it's like you still took that opportunity. It happened to be at the right time. It's like when hard work meets the uh, luck or a point of time that just happens to be a coincidence. But you still had to do the work to get in there, and it happened to be at that time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like there's there's always work involved. Um, mm. uh, there's elements involved, right? Like you've always got the element of luck uh, to make to make things work, and you've always got uh, the element of hard work. Um, yeah, and and obviously you need a bit of both. But yeah, I mean, like there was that many new members, and uh, I don't know if any, if everyone's familiar with City Fit's way of doing things, but basically you sign up to the gym, and they the way they pass it on to their PTs is that that new member has to have a consultation with a personal trainer for the health and safety. Like they have to oh, be yeah, shown yeah. around the gym for the emergency exits and everything like that. And that's, that's the PT's opportunity to take it, take it further and take that yeah. conversation like, Hey, let's go do this, 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 and this. And that, and that's a, a big part of their training to be fair, like got to give credit where it's due. They do that very well. Like they, they mm -hmm. do teach as long as you listen to what they're teaching, obviously, but they do teach, um, in their course uh how, how to sell yourself quite well yeah. and that's something that is obviously very important in in personal training because mm. you could be the best pt in the world but if you can't sell yourself who's going to sign with you yeah yeah the sales business man so yeah. for for personal trainers that could be an interesting learning how, how would you maximize that time that you had with that new person to try and sell yourself the most or the best way that you could i mean everyone's got their own way i suppose of doing that um the city fit method so they did have that safety aspect but then they also had like a a free half hour one hour console i can't remember what, what it was and that was an option so people often would take that because who doesn't want a free yeah why not console, right? why yeah, not free so stuff. i think i'd say over 50 percent of the new members were doing that so you're talking maybe like 40 50 people a week so that's wow. still a hell of a lot of people for that yeah. many pts i mean by the time i left i think there was like 10 pts at city fit uh just in lower Hutt. um and but when I started, there was like six of us. And so it was like, who do it's you want? Unreal. Like have as yeah, many man. as you want, like as people, you know, yeah. take them. Um, and so when you got them on that consult, City Fit had already taught you how to do a consult. And so you'd take them through like some movements, some stretches, blah, blah, blah. Then you, uh, you know, make them feel really good about themselves, that kind of thing. And then you go sit down and be like, hey, like here's your, your forms, like let's go through it all. And then be like, okay, so like, how do you find the session? Yeah, you liked it cool okay here's my rates like you know i recommend that you train four times a week twice with me you know if you do three i can give you this discount and yeah that, that's where the sales yeah. side does come into a big time and that's where personal trainers at least this is what i found too when i first started personal training i hated talking about the money but yeah. you, you, if you're not getting paid you're not getting paid you know you can't live so you still have to talk about it and people what i learned you know over time is that people respected you and wanted to know that up front and yep. it's not it's not weird for you to say i'm no. 60 bucks an hour or something but i think when you go from a lower paid job and then you go into personal training you start on 40 an hour or something you think it's heaps and yeah I started, I think, and i found yeah. it real hard to, to I, I completely that. understand that because mm. you go from wages where you're just yeah. obviously getting getting paid um, but every hour of your time on wages, generally, generally every hour that you work is, is getting paid. So yeah. you have to take that into consideration. Exactly. And so when you do go to the start PT and you, you're trying to uh, ask someone for 60 bucks an hour, mm. you have to remember that that's only for the hour that you're with them. It doesn't yeah. count the hours behind the scenes that you're no. doing the programming, that kind of thing. And so I was mindful of that. Like I knew, okay, like it sounds like a lot, but in reality, I'm going to have to put in two to three hours a week work for that one hour of PT. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So so when you break it down like that, you're actually getting paid less than what, yeah. what you were. Yeah. And so that's where efficiencies come in and having mm -hmm. like, um, you know, pre-written programs that Systems you can just slightly place. adjust to, to the general popul uh, population yeah. and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, having to sell yourself, that's, 
that's probably the biggest learning curve I'd say of someone that yeah. is going into business um, themselves or going into personal mm-hmm. training from other other jobs yeah. where you don't generally because most jobs you don't have to sell. No, you just like, turn up. Your job is to do the do the job yeah. that you're you're uh, hired for, right? Mm. Like that's someone else's job to do the mm-hmm. selling, not yours. So mm. yeah, that, that's a big learning curve. Yeah, and a huge element involved in there. What I found in personal training in terms of sales was just providing as much value to that person as you can in that time. And that consult that you have, I found that more often than not, if you provide them enough value and they're already kind of thinking about it, you know, they have the financial means to pay you, it's already sold. You That's just right. need to explain how it works in terms of payment, frequency and stuff. But they if you provide enough value. Way out, yeah. Then like, you know, you'd have to give them an excuse not to sign with you. Yeah. Then yeah. then to sign with you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's where I feel like most of the selling is done by your ability to make them, like you said, feel good, but then just provide as much value as you can and just create some sort of human connection there, right? Absolutely. That's another element of personal training that sometimes isn't considered is that you're spending a lot of time with this person. If they're training with you one or two hours a week, you have to get along with them because mm. most of the session isn't them moving weights around. Most of it, well, not most of it, but a lot of the session is you're just resting in between sets and yeah. you don't want if to just be there in someone, silence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you go get along yeah. with someone, the training is not going to last, no. let's be honest. Like no. I have had people like on that concert where I knew that the connection wasn't there. And to be honest, I mean, but we're, we're probably talking about a time where I, I could afford to turn people down, but yeah. I'd, still, I'd still, you know, give my all into that session, but I just want to do the selling part at the end. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, you do need to, in that sort of 45 minutes or hour, like sort of decide, Okay, are they going to be a good fit for me? Because if they're yeah. not a good fit, let's be honest, you're just taking the money for no reason, right? Like, mm-hmm. if you know that you're not going to be able to give them everything that they want, or you're yeah. not going to be able to connect with them on some form of uh, some kind of level, then obviously the training is not going to be not going to be great. Speaking from experience, too, the last thing you want is to train a client where the five pm on the Tuesday, you're just like, oh. I got to like spend the next hour with this person. It's not fair on you and it's not fair on them too. Cause there could be a PT who they they get along really well with. So Absolutely. maybe like you're doing yourself and them a disservice by, like you say, just taking the money because they're willing to provide it. That's it. Yeah. Completely agree. Okay. So swallow break. Yeah. 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 All good. <laughs> All right. We're back. Cool back from the toilet break <laughs> okay so we're gonna loop it back so you've started at city fit taking yep. on heaps of clients it's all going good what sort of um gets the ball rolling on on you and dev um deciding to go into business together because the time from you starting personal training to actually opening up the gym it must have only been a year or or something yeah, it must have been far out well uh, eight, eight months till we knew that we were doing it yeah um yeah, so yeah, started at City Fit in the January. Um, yeah, it was got into quite a comfortable spot to be honest. Like, like I was quite lucky like that. Got into quite a comfortable spot. I was working long hours, but I also, you know, I had s- seen how self employment works. Like, my dad has always done long hours and always works yeah. sort of seven days a week. So I knew that that was expected, um, and I knew that it was a case of grinding for your first few uh, first few years. You know, um, so I was definitely I. I went into the into my jobs or my, my new businesses like fully well understanding that it's a hell of a lot of work. So um, expectation management again. Absolutely. <laughs> there, there like, like yep. you got to know what you're in for. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so so we get city. Um, I always knew that I wanted to start a gym at some point. Always thought that it was going to be quite far out of reach financially and for for property that kind of thing. Um, yep. But then. So my dad has a building in Petone, obviously, as you know, and basically about six months into that year, said, uh, just in a passing comment, I think, sort of said, oh, hey, uh, the tenant's going to be moving out. You know, like, do you know anyone that would want that space? And that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And at the time, I was actually, I, I would have actually been flatting with Devon at that time up in Mangaraki. And so I sort of just sort of said to him, I said, oh, you know, if you've ever thought about starting a gym. And so that started that conversation. And um, yeah, basically started talking more to dad about uh, the tenant leaving and like the space and what the deal would be, how it would look, how it would, how it would work. 
and that sort of set set that um ball, uh you know ball rolling so to speak and Dev and I around then we're starting to sort of spitball how it would look what we want you know names yeah. um you know what what what's lacking in the mm. in the industry mm -hmm. like is there actually space for us because yeah. in the Wellington region there's so many options and yes. it's I, I talked to I used to race against um one of the founders of Flex Fitness or, or oh, something wow. something like that like yeah he was like that flex fitness all over the car i believe that he worked in the hq because obviously flex fitness is franchised mm -hmm. so had a chat to him and i remember saying to him hey have you guys ever thought about starting in wellington and he turned and said no because it's so competitive oh wow and so i already knew that wellington was going to be one of the hardest markets to break into which is still true because there's still no flex still fitness true. here no yeah. um their yeah, master i think would be the closest one yeah Oh, unless there's one there's not one in company either i don't think no so yeah we were sort of just spitballing ideas you know we, we knew that we'd probably retain most of our clientele um mm -hmm. from from city yeah um that sort of started that ball rolling we thought that the space was going to be ready in december and yeah then it got a little bit tricky with city fitness um so that transition wasn't wasn't too clean mm. so we was it due to the pro proximity of business oh, i was due to a few things yeah. um, i can't delve too much into it to be <laughs> honest but uh i can sort of say you know like that, yeah as with every, any any contracts that you have mm. as a contractor they they do have clauses which prohibit certain things or like yeah. their, their wishes and their well-being which is being in business myself completely yeah. fair enough even like the sparky business how you were employed oh, yeah. there and then starting your own ones kind of in the same region yeah like they is... they do have restrained trades and that kind of thing yeah. whether or not that's actually able to be held up in, in a court of law is a different story yeah um we're not going to tell too much into that <laughs> but yeah basically thankfully Devin and i in my head did the right thing like we we approached um management yeah city and said hey look this opportunity has risen up um we'd like to to do it what are your thoughts are, the, are we going to have any pushback um at that time they said no <laughs> and we have an email from them saying saying all is good in yeah. response to me saying we're going to start a gym but anyway um so that happened we thought they were in the clear anyway so we created the fitness portal name uh by then and we were planning to open in December of mm -hmm. that would have been 2018. Um, but the space, the tenant ended up staying there longer than expected. We had to finish up at City Fitness in the October. Um, yeah. yeah. And so we finished up there in the October with a with a thought that we'd um, be starting the fitness portal in the December. Obviously, mm. nothing ever happens <laughs> as as to plan. Um, yeah. So we actually ended up starting building in December on the premises, and then obviously opened early Feb. Yeah. What was actually in there before? Was it just like residential tenants, or was it a commercial? It was. Com it's always commercial. It's a yeah. commercial tenancy, but yeah. uh, it was like it was just being used for storage at that time. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, like the guy who had storage there was a joiner and so mm -hmm. they actually made custom coffins oh wow well. yeah yeah something <laughs> yeah. real real diverse <laughs> niche um, market yeah. very niche market yeah um so so yeah he ended up storing stuff there and so he had some machinery and that's that's what was holding him up moving out at that time which it ended up obviously working out um at the time it was very stressful i think i got back down to about 75 kilos around Whoa. that time like over the course of building the gym Fuck um man just uh, from a mixture of things like i didn't have mm. the time to train i was not eating anywhere near enough yeah. to maintain anything like a bodybuilder's diet comes back to spinning plates right you can only spin yeah. too many at once before and, they all crumble so yeah and like i've met with um you know people better than me in business um before and like a business mentor and and he laid it out very sort of clear for me and it, it's really obvious once you once you think about it but you know he said you've got 100 percent of energy and i think at the time i actually had four or five businesses so um and he's like so what you need to do is lay out where you're going to put each section of energy like do you yeah. want to put 30 percent there 30 percent there 
ten percent there, ten percent there, ten percent there. Like, what, what do, you, what's the breakup going to look like? Because you're absolutely right. Like, you, you've only got so much energy. You can't yeah. be awake twenty four hours a day and still give everything you're all. So yeah, you do, you do need to think about these things. Um, but yeah, so at the time, obviously, most of my focus was on on the gym. Um, yeah. The electrical had grown a bit as well, so that was doing okay. And yeah, I had a couple of employees by then and that. And yeah, basically we just started, yeah, we, we, we were training out of Devon's carriage for a wee while there with uh, <laughs> some clients that we retained from, yeah. from City. Um, it would have definitely been a harder time on Devon than myself because I still had the electrical business, whereas yeah, this course. was his all. Yeah. Um, but he was also lucky in the fact that, so, so a lot of my clients, we have different clientele. So like my yeah. clients were very much for the most part, like oh, I need to, I want to gain muscle, blah, blah, yeah. which you can't exactly do out of a garage where some of his clients are more like sports specific and stuff yeah. where it was a bit easier. Um, and so anyway, we were doing that sort of from the October right through to till, till sort of January when we started getting the equipment in the gym. Yeah. And the December through till the open was just manic. That mm-hmm. was absolutely manic. Um, and thankfully, you know, we were, we were doing so much. We were, you know, raising money um, with investors. We, mm. we were trying to plan what our business would actually look like. We were doing building. I was still doing the electrical. We were training clients in between. Um, yeah, looking back, I don't know how the hell we did it. To be honest. <laughs> yeah. but, when you're just in it, you don't have that macro view. Yeah. Right? You just keep doing the day to day. You just keep doing it. And yeah, yeah um, thankfully, we, we managed to open. And, yeah. Yeah, and we managed to, to grow. Petoni was quite a slow process in terms of growth. Um, and yeah, that was that would have been 2018, so that would have been 2019 when we opened, yeah. And, and yeah, you, you're discussing, you know, how you and Dev were having the conversations around, you know, obviously, there's a lot of competition. What's our niche? Where, where did you get to with those conversations? Like, what made you both decide, like, nah, we can do this and we can make something from it? Well, I mean, when you look at the fitness portal for Tony, it's very much a boutique gym, like, yeah. it's. And we we knew, well, we, we we knew that we weren't going to take on the likes of let's say like City Fit and that kind of thing. Mm. So we, there was a lot of trial and, trial and error at the start, and we we definitely did not get the perfect formula straight off the bat. Um, but yeah, we we knew that we had our clients basically. We knew that there was a market there because so many people, you know, City Fit was so busy, but mm. and Les Mills was still so busy that that we knew there was overflowing, uh, you know, overflow. There's market uh, demand out there. Market demand. Like yeah. there's there's so much demand. And a lot of people did want a separate space to the to the major chains, right? So so we knew that that was there. Um C B the Wellington C B D would de- be very different to, yeah. to that. I don't yeah. know if um that would have worked as well. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, we knew we knew that the demand was there. It was just a case of how do we get that and how do we cater it to that. And so we the where we've put ourselves, I think was quite good location wise as well we're right next to bus stops uh you know a lot of pu- public transport so train yeah. stations right there bus stops and also right so this mac bank in between the two city fitnesses yeah which i think was quite important because i yeah. think um otherwise people would just go to city yeah yeah it's bigger, closer yeah close yeah, yeah all those reasons um yeah, and what because it's a small gym. What's the square meterage of that? Because you guys have certainly made the most of that space. Just yeah, to give I mean, people a perspective of the size. I think we're we're actually getting it sort of like valued next week. So so he'll be doing it, but it must be all up around two hundred to yeah. two two twenty squares yeah. total. And that includes like toilets, changing rooms, reception yeah. area. Yeah. So yeah, the gym small. floor itself is probably maybe two thirds of that. Would you say? Yeah, I think the main yeah. gym floor is about one fifty. Yeah. And then the uh, lifting room um, to the side there is about what would that be? Maybe maybe ten squares, fifteen yeah. squares total. <laughs> yeah, five by five. Um, like yeah, yeah. No, it's not even that. It's, it's yeah. like three meters wide by about four meters. Yes, yeah, so a twelve yeah. twelve meters squared. Yeah, but that that's about to be made bigger in uh, mm-hmm. in August. Um, all going to plan. Might, August September. Yeah, um, that'll be getting made a bit bigger and like new group fitness area and that kind of thing, and mm-hmm. try to utilize that space a little bit a little bit better as well. Yeah, but and yeah. then fast forwarding um, a little bit of bit ahead, a couple of years yeah. down the track, obviously you guys have recently just opened the Tower Gym. That's right. What what was the difference in you know the conversations, the ideas, what you had to do from opening the Petoni Gym to opening a 
large facility like the the tower gym yeah very very different thought processes i mean we yeah like we knew that petoni was was just working like like petoni looks after itself mm -hmm. um we also know or knew that petoni long term probably it was it's never it was never our intention to make like huge money from anything obviously yeah. but it, it does need to make money to be viable mm -hmm. and it's not making a huge huge amount of money um where it is it is very much a for the people kind of kind of gym mm -hmm. um so for tower it was very much a different conversation it was like we actually got approached um it's very roundabout way of of it happening i got approached by a good friend of mine whose sister was training with a guy at tower fitness center well and yeah. this was around the time of the mandates coming mm -hmm. and so she plays for new zealand uh football so she, she's yeah uh, you know play play for for the women's team yeah and her pt had approached her saying hey look like the owner isn't getting vaccinated um she's actually going to be selling the gym would you be interested in buying it and of course she's sisters with one of my really good friends so so she was talking to her sister uh who's my friend and and um danielle basically said hey look why don't you sit down with tim have a conversation with tim so met with met with michaela had a chat to her and was like well you know laid it all out i said this is what difficulties like this is where it can work blah 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 um you know you've got to very much want it and anyway they ended up deciding against buying it and then we looked into it and it was just going to be a case of taking over that space so that was tower fitness center not not where we are now mm -hmm. we went there um to look at it and that day it had actually been leased by a completely irrelevant company just oh, wow. like a warehouse company or something yeah. so we, we sort of went there and we're like oh yeah like this is the space it was 600 square meters so it was a lot bigger than what Sheesh. we had in yeah. Tony. um and we're like, oh, you're like this and by then we kind of had that thought we we're like well if we're already thinking about going out here why don't we explore this a little bit more mm -hmm. and so um so we kind of left that and then it was like a week later and we're just sort of looking on trade me at different different places around sort of tower jave all those kind of areas and um we found where we are now on i think it was on trade me something like that um anyway so we got talking to them when I looked at space and obviously it was a gym at the time um and it was the same same case like they wanted out of the lease and so it would just be a case of taking over the lease doing our thing to it and so we looked at it and we were blown away by the size obviously because yeah. we're 1300 square meters <laughs> where compared to our 200 and whatever um in Petone. yeah so we walked in we're kind of like holy shit um this <laughs> yeah. is, this this is massive. Massive, yeah <laughs> And so originally we were planning on only purchase, well, purchasing, only renting about two thirds of it because we're locked into quite a long contract out there. So a little bit of risk, but also reward with the risk. Um, and we looked at that. And then to be honest, we were kind of talking about it. We're just like, screw it. Let's just go all in. Let's get mm -hmm. the whole space and make it something amazing. Um, you know, we, we knew we were going to have to like fundraise again we're going to have to go get some more investment um along with putting some of our own money in obviously um and yeah we we did that um started talking to people getting our current investors on board with it and that's obviously very important so I had a chat to them they were all very supportive of it and and a few of them came back on board which was awesome and then when i got uh, a few new ones as well and yeah kind of made, made it happen that way mm. and it's very it is very different to Petoni. like it's very much more of a commercial feel yeah um but it's with, commercial but has like chloe and i community. were chatting about it yeah when we left today we were just saying man how good the vibe is in the gym there because everyone it's evident that everyone's into training that's there mm. and but they it's evident that everyone also likes everyone who's there too and like we'll stop and have a yarn you know your reception area has the coffee machine and like that's right yeah. it's, it's a real nice vibe in there it's not stale like your classic that, chain gyms that's right and that was one of the main conversations we had was how do we keep the feel that we have at petoni mm. and make that bigger yeah and yeah so so that that was the big thing there so we we have little touches that that are same to to both locations and that we will uh, remain same for any for, for, uh, future locations mm -hmm. so you know little things like how the walkways at tower are all sort of natural wood look 
mm-hmm. you know, and like we have natural wood everywhere, which we also have at uh, Patoni. Mm. And it's little things like that. And that also creates like natural wood also creates sort of that, that vibe a little bit as well, like friendly sort of yep. sort of vibe. Um, and yeah, it was little things like that. And obviously chatting to to sort of um, obviously by now I've been more in the bodybuilding scene. So so kind of pulling more on, on that side of things from my perspective, Devon's into um, Olympic weightlifting. So so there's that. So we've both got our tangents there with uh, different styles of training and, and different networking that we can utilize. Yep. Um, yeah, so basically got more or less the money that we needed um, and then started going about like ordering the equipment, like obviously signed the lease by that point, and that, that, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I reckon, although you probably still have more plans for the Tower Gym, I'd say especially for weight training, I reckon it's probably the best gym in Wellington to go and do weight training for the atmosphere that we chatted about, but the equipment selection and just the pure size of it as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. But um, that was huge for, for us. Yeah, it was mm. providing something that isn't provided for yet. Yeah. And that's that's how we how we looked at it. We know we knew that, you know, there's City Fit Fitness New Orleans, there's City Fitness Pororo, but there's not a huge amount else around those northern suburbs um, mm. that cater to people. And let's be honest, City Fit New Orleans and Pororo. I mean, Pororo is a little run down. Yeah. New Orleans is brand new, but it's packed to the yeah. brim with people. Um, and then their equipment just doesn't match what ours does. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was very important from my point of view was coming up with equipment that a, nobody really has in Wellington yet, like just different mm-hmm. kinds of machines, you know, like the pendulum squats, the belt squats, the vertical mm-hmm. leg press, that kind of thing. We've got a few other goodies coming um, shortly that, that nobody else has either. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys but, have but the but stuff machines the only... that work yeah. as but well. Those machines are the only, you only see those machines on social media. You see one of your favorite bodybuilders using like that row machine that you have, mm-hmm. the... Um, what do you even the call chest it? supported row chest supported row yeah. yeah and you've got the adjustable handles and stuff and i see people using those like the hypertrophy coach and hunter labrada and those kind of guys and every time i'm like damn that'd be good to use that and then that's the piece that you guys have same with the pendulum squat vertical leg press those things you only see on social media they're not accessible to us here in wellington and then all Absolutely. of a sudden they are and the, it was that kind of conversation that we had around how we would make Tawa work and how it was different to Petoni. I mean, Petoni was built more on the back backs of us, you know, more or less, and the backs of word of mouth and people that we knew. Yeah. Um, whereas Tawa is more, because it's so much bigger, we knew that we were going to have to provide something different. Mm-hmm. We knew that we we're going to have to provide something that is a premium product um, at a reasonable cost um, that will attract attract people, you know. Absolutely. And, and like, I think I think we've achieved that so far obviously i do have more plans and there is is more happening there it's i mean it'll it'll never stop because Mm -hmm. i want to keep keep growing it yeah um but it's absolutely working though i saw one of my mates here this morning and he was like bro i've just seen so many people posting about this gym mm -hmm. i just had to come and try it like that machine that machine and that's exactly you know obviously the intention that you guys had is clearly coming to fruition that's right that's right mm-hmm. and that's that's what we want to create i mean it's we can still fit a huge amount more people in there than what yeah. we've got but it is trending trending mm-hmm. upwards and that yeah you're right like uh, i mean even i see it with people that i didn't even realize knew yeah. about the gym yeah, that we're yeah, posting yeah. or sharing something about the gym yeah. from someone that i you know don't really know and i'm like mm-hmm. that's awesome that's exactly what we want mm-hmm. um and yeah like there's still still more to do there but i think it's yeah it's already it's a, it's a good base very good mm. base and you know little things like having a very good posing room mm. for the bodybuilding community um you know having a good group fitness room um for for that side of things as well and just we also offer functional fitness as uh you know on the side there as well which is more your crossfit style yeah. which is something that we don't haven't offered in batoni before um but simply due to space, to be honest, we don't really have the space to offer that uh, out mm. in Tony ways yet. Um, but yeah, like it was, it was offering all those services in one place, and that's always our big thing, right? Is like even at Patoni, we've got the massage therapists, we've got the access to supplements, uh, yeah. we've got your personal trainers, your coaches, mm. your nutrition advice, we've got everything you need in one place for your for your uh, health and fitness. You know, that, mm. that's our whole thing. In terms of the culture that you're creating at Tawa. Is there any concern around it becoming 
too heavily focused on bodybuilding and that like make the everyday kind of members um intimidate or apprehensive to go into the gym um yes and no so i mean i wouldn't be too too worried about it like the bodybuilding vibe being there but i I do completely understand what you're saying and Devin and i have spoken at links about that kind of thing I, i think we're doing quite a good job so far at at creating the vibe for everybody like yeah. so far it's real welcoming obviously yeah. that's coming from my perspective where i also wouldn't mind if it was just the own bodybuilders yeah. only gym but to me it still feels really welcoming absolutely but we haven't had any feedback yet that it's not welcoming mm. and i mean we do have quite uh like we do have an older demographic there as well um yeah. and they we haven't had any complaints yet so mm. That, that's fantastic and that, that's what we will always keep an eye on and if there yeah. is an issue we we address it and that's mm-hmm. i guess where one of the main differences is with a gym such as us over someone like city fitness or les mills where there's yeah. so many more uh logistical processes and hoops to jump through before yeah. you can make a change yeah like for us we'd make a change like you know that snap of the fingers yeah. you got it, the autonomy it, yeah that's it and most people there share, share sort of our vision yeah and it's not it's not just a bodybuilder's gym it's definitely no. not just a bodybuilder's no. gym we just provide great equipment yeah. that anyone can use and yeah. let's be honest the machines spa- are safe yeah and, and yeah. but the space that you have to can easily cater to a big crossfit community olympic lifting community right. like you said as well because there's so much space versus a smaller gym that's only got weights equipment in it you yeah you and, clearly and establish a niche then that's right and that's why we've got you know like the deadlift platforms and olympic racks and the crossfit rig in in mm. that area and then we've got machines in that area and free weights in, in a separate area you yeah. know it's to create that sort of uh feeling that no matter what you're there for you know you, you're welcome yeah. and and that's very important i mean we're also you know we also do things like sponsor certain events and like get behind mm. um certain athletes uh to, to try and promote that side as well no matter whether it's bodybuilding olympic lifting crossfit whatever yeah um, we're always interested in helping out so uh i mean like for instance i think we're looking at helping out with the um national secondary schools olympic lifting uh competition which is oh, in Poro cool. and i think that's october um we're looking at sort of sponsoring that but also offering oh, a space awesome. for a safe space for the say, athletes it's only down the road too that's awesome yeah yeah uh, that's it that's it it's pyro so it's nice and local um but then obviously there's also the ifb wellington show which is an mm-hmm. here this year and we do have that posing room available there so you know um it's again somewhere safe that athletes can come and like check on their tan before the show or like whatever they might want to get yeah. pumped up or like all that kind of stuff so yeah, we, we utilize it to to cater to most sports but then obviously it's such a reasonably sized space that there is enough space there for anyone like yeah even if there's five bodybuilders there training in the corner you're not really going to notice them if you're off uh, on the other side on the machines yeah. working out just just general population but mm-hmm. yeah no i'm not too worried about that what is um on the future horizon for you that you can give us some insight into obviously you've got the show coming up is there anything else that's um on your horizon that are in your goals or in your sights at the moment uh definitely no more new businesses yeah (laughs) got enough (laughs) i've got enough for now um yeah obviously i've got the competition in wellington coming up um and i've got nationals after that and which is also a classic physique pro show so you know if i'm if i'm lucky and i win my pro card at wellington Mm because there is a pro card up for grabs in my division um then i'll be going to that pro show but uh that's a big thing for me i've got 28 now so Mm -hmm. my goal is to be pro by uh, by 30. yeah and if i'm not then i might reevaluate sort of what i'm doing and obviously Mm -hmm. starting to get it will start getting pretty taxing on on the on the old body at that point um because it has been three years in a row now of competing yeah and so it'll be you know like four or five years yeah. on the trot uh competing um but yeah basically where i'm at i want to keep growing the fitness portal that's mm-hmm. that's the big one and keep at it with with the electrical um the other businesses yeah like obviously keep keep trying to grow them at the same time but, but those two are my my primary focuses and awesome, uh, yeah i am looking at buying another race car but they'll very much be <laughs> like a, a hobby, that's a hobby. yeah 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 so we'll see see how that goes man that's awesome i feel like um 
we've definitely got some more podcast episodes up our sleeve, I reckon, given yeah, the, the, the range <laughs> of topics that we've touched on. I'd be super keen to do future episodes delving into more specific topics. I think today the intention was to get a better understanding of you, the amount of plates that you spin and the key learnings that um, you've discovered along the way. And it sounds like there's been quite a few key learnings. One thing I've noticed that's come up in a lot of your um, stories or the things that you've experienced is you putting in the work and then the moment of opportunity coming up and you capitalizing on that moment of opportunity that sounds like it's come up a lot with the personal training the opening of the gym like both gyms it seems yeah. like you've put in the groundwork and then the opportunity comes up and then you yeah. capitalize on the opportunity yeah absolutely you're absolutely correct i think um yeah you need to jump on jump on those opportunities like mm. when an opportunity presents itself be in a position to to be able to jump on it or or at least make an educated decision not to mm -hmm. um because not every opportunity is gold either mm. um but yeah like you can't just let opportunities go by no otherwise uh you know where, where are you gonna where are you gonna go <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right oh well, thanks each for coming on today man i feel like that kind of brings us to the end of the episode it feels like a good time to call it but i really appreciate you coming on today and I hope the people listening have also learned some things because I've certainly learned a few things from you today. It's been very insightful. Yeah, thank you. No, thanks for thanks for having me, and always happy to to come on and have a chat. And, and yeah, and shout out to the fitness portal too. If you're in Wellington or if you're ever travelling to Wellington, make sure you check out the gym in either Patoni or Tawa. Absolutely. Everyone's really welcoming. I'd recommend you go along and have a train. Come see us. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, catch you later. Catch up. Bye.